I thought we might begin tonight with just some things that uh, have come in, the ideas or thoughts that have come in to me on email, not from listeners to the show, but during the week in response to my articles. Uh, my articles sometimes evoke a great deal of fire and brimstone from people who disagree with it. For instance, I did get a letter, uh, an email from somebody who was complaining about what I had to say about the war in Iraq and what the Bush was right and that sort of thing. And this person said, just think of what could have happened if we had had the support of you and other naysayers in this effort, meaning the Iraqi war. Now, I'll just interrupt there and take that point because he's going to go on to another point. But what would that have done? Suppose there had been no opposition to the war whatsoever. Think about it for a second. What would have happened then if I hadn't opposed the war, if a lot of other people like the Truth Out organization or Move On or some of these others had not opposed the war? What would have happened? Well, obviously, they could have done anything they wanted to do. And there would have been perhaps no investigations of Abu Ghraib because nobody would be complaining about it. Nobody would seek to make this information known to the public in order to show that war is not the kind of thing you want your children getting involved in. Also, American troops might have been in Iraq, uh, pardon me, in Iran by now, or Syria, or Lebanon, or who knows where, because of the fact that none of the bad news about Iraq would have surfaced. So... I think that it would be a great mistake to ever wish that your point of view is going to be the only point of view heard. That could be real trouble, because then, maybe not you, but people that are on your side will suddenly become so, should I say, overconfident or arrogant or whatever, that they will do terrible things. Just like we had the witch hunts in Massachusetts, because the Puritans at that time were so much the dominant part of society and it wasn't that everybody in that society was a witch hunter but the, the dominance was so strong that those who opposed witch hunting by giving their support to the prevailing pos position had simply made it impossible to stop the witch hunts once they started uh, that's just one example the writer goes on to say you will remember that the democrats all wanted a war with iraq when clinton was president now i'm sorry but i don't remember that but if that was true and I, I kind of doubt that it was but if that was true then that just gets, goes to show you that these wars are political that the democrats will support a democratic president and you republicans because i presume the person who wrote this in is a bush supporter you will support a war when a, your president is there when it's a guy from your party and there must be something a war people die in wars and he goes on about that you lament the lost lives of the enemy and ignore the thousands of innocent babies murdered each day in the u.s. well first of all that all the tens of thousands of people who died in Iraq so far are not the enemy. The civilians are not the enemy. They weren't firing. Even the people who were firing, the soldiers, are not really the enemy. Supposedly, we went in there to remove weapons of mass destruction, and when that proved to be unnecessary, then our government went in there to bring democracy to Iraq. But that doesn't mean that all the people who died in the bombings and the missiles that went astray and so forth were all the enemy. So let's look at them as human beings and not as the evil enemy. And But he went on to say, and you ignore the thousands of innocent babies murdered each day in the U.S. Well, the writer has ignored the 60,000 people who died in the 1960s because the FDA wouldn't uh, uh, approve of beta blockers. But so what? We're not talking about abortion. We're not talking about the FDA. We're talking about the war in Iraq. I was talking about an email that I received, and um, if we have the time tonight, I'll give you a couple of other emails that I've received. And the only reason I'm doing this is because I recognize these objections or arguments as ones that you may very well run into among people and they're not all having to do with the war the ones that I picked out here in fact a couple of them deal very de definitely with the heart of libertarian philosophy and so I think that they can be very useful to you in answering objections but we'll finish off first with the fellow who says that I lament about the lost lives of the enemy I mean, let me put it back in his words you, you Harry Brown lament about the lost lives of the enemy and ignore the thousands of innocent babies murdered each day in the US well I also lament the thousands of innocent babies that are killed in abortions. And I am opposed to abortion, and probably more opposed to abortion than the writer of this letter. And that's a pretty arrogant statement on my part, but here's why I believe that. What he's going to do about abortion is to run to the state and hope to get a law passed, forcing people to do as he thinks best, and finding out that nothing you ever get from the government works. That, you know, if the government handed you a new car, it wouldn't drive. If the government gave you a computer, you wouldn't be able to hook up with anything or anybody. And going to the government is not the answer. But supporting people who are trying to help get rid of the shameful adoption laws we have in these, this country, 
which makes it hard to legally adopt babies and therefore makes it more attractive for women to go the abortion route instead of having the baby and putting it up for adoption. And there are all sorts of other impediments to it, but there are also positive things that can be done. The advertisements that the Mormon Church ran a few years ago celebrating life and the people who were not aborted and became something. Uh, all of these things are ways of actually changing people's minds instead of sticking a gun to their head. And when you change minds, you've got them forever. You stick a gun to their heads, and as soon as they go around the corner and out of, are out of your sight, they are right back to doing what they were doing before. Finally, he says, perhaps you and, uh, pardon me, perhaps if you and the Democrats hate Bush Party, keep it up, maybe you can move the front line of the war on terror from Baghdad to St. Louis and other U.S. cities. Well, I must agree that I am not very much in love with George Bush, as anybody listening to this show knows, but I have no corner, no monopoly on hate. I mean, look at this letter that I got. This guy hates me, he hates uh, the Democrats, whom he ties me in with, and uh, hates anybody who has opposed this war and not supported George Bush. So don't let anybody tell you that you are a hater because you are opposed to the war. Don't let anybody tell you you're anti-American because you're opposed to the war. You are for American values, which we like to think are individual liberty and personal responsibility, very small government, and very small governments do not wage wars. All right, well, let's go to a question that came in just now this evening that has a lot to do with what we're talking about here because he's pointing out, Rob in Michigan is pointing out an argument that is presented to him. He says, when selling liberty, it is often useful to cite the first hundred years or so of our country's existence, save for the Civil War. And those first hundred years were at a time when the government was relative, relatively unobtrusive and our society was more libertarian. Detractors, however, are quick to point out that the institution of slavery existed during this time, which certainly doesn't square with a message of liberty. How do you address the issue of slavery when discussing this time period? Well, first of all, slavery was not pervasive throughout the entire Union. It was pervasive only in the South, although it also existed in the northern states, but to a much, lo lower, status, uh, a much lower level. And people tended, some people tended to migrate to parts of the country based on what that slavery policy was. But we must understand that slavery is not a libertarian concept. And if we had been born in that time, if we had been around in 1840, and I had a radio show <laughs> in 1840, I would have been preaching against slavery the same way I am preaching against the war today. Because I do not like to see people enslaved. I do not like to see people uh, killed. I do not like to see people deprived of their liberty. And it is interesting to note that there were many, many countries that had slavery at the beginning of the 19th century. But at the end of the 19th century, no Western developed country had slavery anymore. And the United States was the only one of all those countries, which included Britain and some of the uh, other major countries, the United States was the only one of those countries that ended slavery in a bloody civil war. And, of course, our civil war cost over a half million lives. So it was a terrible, terrible thing. And it wasn't even thought over slavery. Slavery only came into to the uh, arguments pro and con in the latter part of the war. Even Lin Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was a fraud. It didn't emancipate a single slave. And, in fact, it promised the southern states that if they came back in the Union, they'd be able to keep their slaves. So Lincoln was not the great emancipator. But it did end slavery as a legal institution. And the only other country that had any kind of violence in getting rid of slavery was Haiti, where the slaves themselves overthrew the government and instituted a new government. Pretty much the way our forefathers seceded from the British Empire, they just overthrew the existing government and took over in Haiti on their own. But all, all this must also recognize that slavery was legally uh, adopted, that in those states that uh, were considered slave states, all the workings of the law were on the side of the slave owners, and the state itself would run down slaves that escaped. It wasn't just a free market institution, although there was a marketplace for slaves. The fact of the matter is that the slaves were held against their will, and if they escaped, the state would intervene to catch them and return them to the slave owners. Government, in other words, was a willing partner in slavery. So once again, what we have to do is to reduce government to the absolute minimum so that people can live with individual liberty, personal responsibility, and very small government poking in their lives. Again, we have some more emails coming in. Uh, Mark in Dallas says, No, you're wrong, Harry. I can tell you now. If you keep opposing the war in Iraq, we will all end up speaking Arabic. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, wonderful parody on all those people who tell us that if America hadn't gotten involved in World War II, we'd all wind up speaking German or Japanese, depending on whether you're talking to somebody on the East Coast or the West Coast. Uh, anyway, thanks, Mark. That's, I like that. Kelly in uh, Portland, Oregon says, I've been thinking about socialism. Kelly, I keep telling you, don't think about socialism. No, Kelly says, I've been thinking about socialism. Doesn't socialism essentially validate capitalism? I mean, it appeals to people's desires to get freebies. More accurately, it draws on our own self-interest, sadly, via collectivism. 
If people weren't inherently capitalistic or individualistic, maybe socialism would be completely moot. Well, we have a problem here with terms. I don't like to use the word capitalism, uh, not that I'm opposed to capitalism, but simply because the word is so misunderstood. Now, I know some people say the word libertarian is misunderstood, but I feel we can deal with that very, very quickly. But capitalism, of course, really is meant to be a system in which the government doesn't intervene in any way whatsoever, but it turns out to be a system in which businesses sometimes are rewarded by the state, supposedly to help the economy to do other things and so on. But So I don't care for that too much, and, or socialism either, but as terms to get into a conversation. But, Kelly, you're touching on something very important, and that is that self-interest does motivate everybody. And really, self-interest itself, as a term, can be misunderstood. What everyone is seeking is in my opinion, the feeling of mental well-being. And that feeling of mental well-being is what we call happiness. It is a slight feeling of euphoria, whatever it may be, a feeling of satisfaction, and its opposite is a mental feeling of discomfort. And people try to remove discomfort from their lives, and they try to, to do things that will bring them that mental feeling of well-being that we call happiness. Now, people seek that feeling of well-being in different ways. Some people do it by going into business and arranging mutually profitable exchanges with other people that make other people happy, but also in the process give oneself the wherewithal to acquire the things that will make that person happy. Other people uh, seek that feeling of happiness by robbing banks. Some other people seek that feeling of well-being by helping the poor or just doing good works for people in one way or another uh, because it makes them feel good. And if you took that opportunity away from them, they would not feel as good as they did before. And lastly, uh, and I'm skipping over a lot of different types of groups in society, but lastly, we have those people that Kelly is referring to here, and that is those people who believe that they can get what they need for happiness through the state what Kelly is referring to as socialism, collectivism. And that also is another way that some people think that happiness can be attained. And, of course, some people, I don't think there are a lot of them, but some people really believe that the world will be better or the country will be better or a race will be better or an economic group will be better if the state engages in this program or that program or whatever, and all the lessons of history are of no avail in arguing against that sometimes. And, of course, sometimes it is... Uh, just uh, a group of people see where they themselves will be better off with whether it's farm subsidies or high tariffs that keep foreign competition out or whatever it is, and so they try to use the state. But, you know, where I differ with a lot of people is I don't believe that there are a great many people in America who are trying to advance their lives through the state. Certainly, if you hand them a subsidy, if you say, hey, here, don't, don't overlook this. Uh, your child can get a student loan or, or a Pell Grant or something else, and you won't have to pay that exorbitant uh, price for his college education by yourself. The state will help you do it. Certainly, those people will accept the subsidies that are urged upon them. But basically, the people who are promoting what you call socialism or collectivism, collectivism or what is really just plain old big government of whatever kind is going to be, the people who are doing the most to promote big government are the politicians. Because in the final analysis, there is one group that always profits from practically every government program, and that is the politicians. Only rarely does a program go bad publicly, so publicly, that the politicians are held in disrepute for having voted for it, and even have to pay a consequence by being voted out of office. That's so rare that I can't even give you an example from the last few years. Maybe you know one somebody out there, and you might enlighten us. But the point is that the politicians get reelected over and over, and part of the way they do that is just by siphoning money off from what we think is the military budget or we think is some program to help the poor. But in their eyes, it's just another program with a whole lot of money floating around, so much that nobody will notice if they siphon off in, in the bill a certain amount of money to go to their political backers or the people that will just make sure that there's enough money to do enough advertising in the next race to make sure they get reelected. And the politicians, as you know, in Congress, get reelected at a rate far above 90%. And I read recently that in the last race, 2004, of all those congressmen who stood for re-election, 98% were re-elected. So anyway, to get back to Kelly's uh, question, we have to look at this from the standpoint that people are doing what they think is best for themselves in the sense that it will bring them happiness. And it's our job to show them that they can be much happier, whatever their motives or whatever their ways to happiness may be, whether it is to help others or to uh, help themselves or whatever, that they can are more like let's say they are more likely to get it by getting rid of government out of their lives and having a great deal more money on their own to spend and a great deal more liberty to do things that will actually carry out what they want. Again, whether it's helping the poor or making a million dollars for themselves. 
And a little while ago, we were talking about slavery in the United States in the first hundred years. And Eric, who very often brings up something very uh, pertinent, in his email says, what is the definition of slavery? If it is involuntary servitude, then what is the draft? When the slaves were emancipated, did they have to go into the army? I know there were draft rights in New York. And also, what is 50% taxation if it isn't 50% slavery? Well, those are both very good points. The draft certainly is. And when I went in the army as a young man, even though I was not the libertarian that I am today, or even the libertarian I was yesterday, but when I was a young man, even then I understood that I was being dragooned against my will, and I even brought this up to the lieutenant who was the, what would normally be the commanding, yeah, I guess he was the commanding officer of my basic training company. I was about to say would be the captain. Usually a captain is the commanding officer of a company. But in any event, I brought that up and, of course, was told that I was there to protect freedom and to prevent slavery and to protect American freedom by going over and fighting in Korea, which fortunately I didn't have to do. But uh, it's, it's just obviously, it's prima facie. I mean, you can't simply take people away from their homes against their will and not call it involuntary servitude. And whatever, what other definition of slavery is there but involuntary slavery, uh, servitude? And Eric is equally right about taxation. If you work 40 hours a week and half of what you uh, earn during those 40 hours goes to the government against your will, then half the time you worked, you were working for the government. Now, instead of that being 100% of your time, it may turn out to be only 16 hours out of the 168 in the week. But still, you have had to spend that time against your will working for the government, and it is slavery. So if somebody brings up the slavery in the first 100 years, you can say very simply, well, fortunately, slavery was eliminated in a very poor way of going about eliminating it, but it was eliminated, and now what we're trying to do is to eliminate the involuntary servitude of our young people serving in the draft and the involuntary servitude of you having to put in a certain number of hours a week to support programs that you do not agree with and, in fact, you oppose, and yet you still are dragooned into working a certain number of hours a week to support those programs through the government. All right, Bob has written in this evening to say, It is my belief that the war on Iraq is all about oil. I believe it was a premeditated action designed to secure the supply of sweet oil. I believe that our businesses and government realize that any disruption in the oil supply will seriously impact our economy and people. Uh, let me stop there. That brings up an important point. If the government did not decide things like energy policy, as they call it, if the, we had a totally free market, if a lot of the oil was not on government property but was on private property, then we wouldn't be having all these discussions about whether this is about oil or whether we should uh, drill for oil in the Arctic Circle or this, that, or the other thing. It would be simply a market decision. When it was needed to drill the oil, that the price of the oil became so high because the oil was so precious, then, in fact, people would be happy to see drilling take place in certain places that they might not have otherwise, but it would still be up to the property owner to decide whether he was willing to release that oil. And if the oil became too scarce then we would have people spending a tremendous amount of time developing alter alternative sources of energy. And even those that today do not seem to work, like hydrogen, cars, and so forth, they might be made to work when there are more really sharp minds devoted to the problem. But today, there aren't that many people devoting themselves to that problem because our government is attempting to make us believe that the oil will always be there. And if necessary, they'll go over and kill a bunch of Arabs in order to make that oil available. And pardon my using the word that way, but that's the way people think of those over there. And as a result, uh, we don't have any understanding of what the true price of oil is because beyond the $55 a barrel we're paying today, we're paying a huge amount for oil in the military budget because the military is out trying to secure oil and to secure the, the sea lanes to get the oil from there to here, you know, on and on and on and on and on. So it really is unfortunate that we don't have a marketplace in oil uh, in all of these energy products. If we did, we would need to be thinking about it because everything would operate as naturally as other markets do. So let me hurry through the rest of Bob's question. He says, what do you suggest we should do if China, for example, were to take an aggressive position and try to forcibly secure the Middle East oil as their own? Do we just suck it up and pay more money for the oil from whomever will sell it to us? Well, first of all, war is never the answer. If a war is put upon us by people trying to invade this country, then, of course, we're not instituting the war. We're not initiating or instigating a war. Uh, we are just simply defending our country in the true sense of the word. But to go overseas and to fight China or to, to try to invade Middle Eastern countries to secure the oil and so forth, that can never, ever be the answer. Force does not work. It never provides the benefits that are promised for it at the beginning. And we would not be so worried about Middle East oil if there weren't energy policies in the United States that prevent the free 
development of new oil supplies here and by the subsidizing of oil by our government, as I mentioned, through the military and, and all of these foreign adventures designed to try to keep the oil flowing, those subsidies, in effect, keep out alternative forms of energy. Now, I'm not a big fan of wind power or solar power or sea power or any other kind of alternative form of energy. I'm just I'm happy with things the way they are. But if oil really is becoming scarce, I don't believe it is, but if it is really becoming scarce, then... Uh, then we should have an open market whereby there is an incentive for people to develop alternatives before we're suddenly up against the wall and have to have some crash government program to try to do it because the free market has been precluded. But there's another point that we should never forget. If Saddam Hussein controls the oil, suppose he had invaded Kuwait just merely to steal Kuwait's oil and was then going to invade Saudi Arabia, Arabia to steal Saudi Arabia's oil, as was implied back in 1990 when they were hammering the drums then to go to war with Iraq. Suppose he did get control of a large quantity of oil. So what? What's he going to do with it? Drink it for breakfast? Uh, use it to lubricate something? He's got to sell the stuff. It's worthless to him unless he sells it in the open market. And if it becomes too expensive, people will simply consume less of it. They won't use it for some purposes that they did before. And other people will be scurrying around trying to find alternative forms of energy. And other people will start drilling for oil in places where it used to be too expensive to drill there, but now it's no longer too expensive because the price of oil has gone up. We should not worry about who controls the oil, whether it's Iraq or China or whomever, because they have to sell it in the marketplace. Nobody can get whatever price he wants. He's going to have to negotiate it. So going to war to save the oil is just plain murder. All right, before the break, we were talking about oil and the need, uh, apparent need for our government to go secure oil around the world, and I saying that that is not only not necessary, it is counterproductive. And Bob, who brought up the question, says, uh, now, I agree with what you're saying, but unfortunately our government has screwed us. What now? Principle number one in this area is, just because the government has created a bad situation, never fall for the idea that now government must do something to get us out of it. And that idea is very prevalent, and that's what keeps government getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, I know. We never should have gotten into this program, but now the only way out of it is to invest more money to do this, to do that, whatever it is. In my debate with Larry Clayman in the television show that's on the Free Market News Network, uh, he agreed that times were much better before the drug war. And he even agreed that the drug war had created some of the decline in morals and problems that exist in society today, but now that those problems exist, we must call on the government to do something about it, as though the government's going to solve any problem. So the answer to the question, Bob, is that we must get the government completely out of it. Stop the government from engaging in foreign wars and starting foreign wars or getting involved in somebody else's foreign wars. Stop the government from trying to set energy policy and decide what's the right form of energy and how much of it should be produced and how the tax code should be altered to encourage what we think should be produced and on and on and on and get the government out of it. Yes, that's a tough task. Yes, we, it's true that we might not succeed with it in the next few years, but it's the only policy that could possibly work. So there is no reason to endorse any other policy. There is no reason uh, to in any way whatsoever say, well, because we're advocating something that isn't likely to be put into effect in the next five years, we should instead advocate something that won't work at all. All right, turning to another subject, Jonathan in Washington, D.C., who always has some interesting comments on whatever it is we're talking about. He says, I watched your Free Market News Network show today, that's a television show, and enjoyed it. But while I understand that you want to have civil discussions with your guests, I thought you could have taken more control of the interview with Larry Clayman, a drug war defender. You didn't even get to mention all the police corruption, the wasted money, and the privacy invasions that result from the drug war. It would have been great to hear Mr. Clayman, a lawyer who has fought against such things in the past, respond to these points. Well, I have to agree with you. Uh, when the interview was over, I realized that, were, that there were a number of things that could have been brought up. And, in fact, it really came down to me being almost the opposite of what these arrogant talk show hosts are doing. What they do is to make a speech of about three or four minutes, and then say, what do you think about that, Mr. So-and-so? And the guest starts to respond and gets about one sentence out before the host interrupts him and goes back into another speech. I did just about the opposite. I asked a question and let Larry go on at some distance and then tried to point out the fallacy in what he was saying by asking a question that brought up the, the um, inconsistency or whatever it may be. Uh, you're right, Jonathan. He... If, I have not seen the interview on television, but when I watch it, I might just clock it and see how much time he had and how much time I had. And, of course, if he had twice as much or three times as much as I did, that's my fault because it was my show. And I am really not a very good interviewer. I'm probably twice or three times as good as I was when I started on the radio about six years ago. But I still envy a lot of talk show hosts that I am interviewed by whom I see as being excellent at the job. And I want to get better. And 
I haven't had a lot of guests on this radio show, and perhaps I should have more, and I'm open to any suggestions of guests that anybody wants to uh, send me, either by email or calling in. But uh, I take your comments to heart, Jonathan, and we'll see what happens next week. I believe I'm going to be talking uh, to somebody who is in charge of what I would call a hate Muslim wall, uh, website. In other words, those dirty Muslims are trying to take over the world type of approach. Jonathan has another question. He says, you may know that the Libertarian National Committee has decided to raise Libertarian Party dues from $25 per year to $50 per year after the first year of membership. In other words, first year 25 then 50 That move has provoked a huge reaction from various LP members, both positive and negative. I'd like to know any thoughts you might have about this decision. Well, I was aware of the decision. I have not paid a lot of attention to it. I've been so busy. Uh, getting this TV show uh, ready for production, and a lot of other activities that I'm involved with now that I have not been that close to Libertarian Party affairs. Uh, I have noticed, however, in the email that comes flowing into my inbox that a lot of the opposition is coming from people who are perennially complaining about the Libertarian Party's policies. And we're just taking questions about how to discuss certain things, uh, various things that are in the news or pertaining to the philosophy of individual liberty and the idea that liberty always finds a way to work and to take care of problems that exist, whereas the state always has a way to solve problems, but none of them ever work. Uh, Bob, once again on all this, I really would like it if you'd take the current situation into account and spell out how we should move forward, given our current situation. If the oil was stopped now, we would be in deep trouble. Well, the oil is not going to stop now. Whether or not we have a military presence in the Middle East, we are going to continue to have access to oil. We are going to get it from Middle Eastern countries. We're going to get it from Venezuela. We're going to get it from Indonesia. We're going to get it from Canada. We're going to get it from the United States, because none of these countries has an interest in stopping the oil coming to the United States. The United States is the biggest consumer of oil in the world, and the worst thing in the world that those oil-producing companies, uh, countries can imagine is the United States not buying oil from them. So they are going to make sure that the oil is available to us. And if we were not messing around in Iraq today, it's very likely that the price of oil would not be $55 a barrel, but more like $20 or $30 a barrel, if not less than that. You know, in the 1970s, it seemed that this oil situation was going to just keep going up and going up. Oil had been $3 a barrel in the 1960s, if you can possibly imagine that. And when the 1973 Israeli-Arab oil, uh, Israeli-Arab uh, war broke out, the Arab countries put a boycott on sending oil to the United States. Well, that didn't last very long because they suddenly realized that they didn't have the money to buy new Mercedes and other things. And so the boycott ended, but OPEC, which had been in existence for a while, suddenly decided to try to control the price of oil. And they succeeded in controlling the price of oil. If they said it's now going to be $10 a barrel, which they did, um, there was nothing anybody could do about it because... That was the principal source of oil in the world. And there was not a lot of new oil being produced in the United States. Why? Because there were price controls on oil and natural gas producers. And it was not profitable to do so because uh, no matter how much it cost for the oil, you could only charge so much for it. And it was not the market price, and it was not really enough to warrant risking a lot of money in looking for new holes of oil. Anyway... The price continued to go up during the 70s as OPEC seemed to rule the world, and it eventually got up to $30 a barrel at the end of the decade. And uh, what happened, though, was that Jimmy Carter started the process of getting rid of the price controls on oil in the United States. Oh, one more thing. During the 70s, you couldn't find, you could hardly, let us say, find anybody in the investment world or the financial publishing world, in other words, people who wrote about finances and barons in the Wall Street Journal and, and in daily newspapers and so on. You could hardly find anybody who didn't think the price of oil was just going to continue going up forever, find somebody who didn't think that the Arabs were going to have all the money in the world within another decade and so on, and people were scared to death that the Arabs were going to buy up the United States. And anyway... Uh, Jimmy Carter started the process of getting rid of these price controls, but he wanted to do it over something like a five-year period or more that we should not disrupt the market by doing it all at once. And when Ronald Reagan came into office, he did one thing that I know of in his entire eight years that was really a libertarian act, despite all the rhetoric when he was running in the, 19, in the 1980 campaign and in all of his speeches over the 20 years before that. He did only one thing that I would consider a truly a libertarian act that a libertarian president would do, and that is he immediately, ended the price controls on oil and natural gas, not waiting out the transition period that Carter had specified. I applaud Jimmy Carter for doing something, but Ronald Reagan did the right thing. And you know something? Suddenly, oil sprouted up from all over the United States. The price of oil, which had been $30 a barrel, went down and down and down and down, and by the middle of the decade, it was $6 a barrel, 20% of what it had been at the peak in the 1970s. It is the same thing today. You never solve the problem 
by pouring more government on it or getting another government policy to solve a failed government policy. What you do is you take a sword and you just slice it through the Gordian knot and end it once and for all. That is the only solution. And when people say that we are too extreme, that we should be uh, advocating transition programs and take a little off the income tax, and then maybe we'll take a little more and then a little more and so forth, and that people can accept this, that, I'm afraid, is the road to destruction, because what happens is that phase-out program over a period of time, the program itself will be phased out very quickly and will be back to growing government rather than reducing government. And people will not even support us if we're not providing something radical enough that they can see that it will make an enormous difference in their lives. What if Ronald Reagan had gone to the people and said, I want to advocate a program here whereby we can reduce the price of oil from $30 a barrel to $25 a barrel over the next year or two? Who would have bothered to support him? Oh, well, the usual Republican hacks, of course. They would have said this was really a great act of leadership on his, his part. But he would have never gotten the great public behind you because who cares whether it's 30 or $25 a barrel? But by ending the price controls, he reduced the price of oil by 80%. And if he had gone to the public and asked if they would be in favor of that, he would have had a, an outpouring of support from people. Of course, he didn't have to get the public approval. He just did it, which was good. And we come back again to the point that we are not going to get anywhere by offering moderate proposals. And all of these people who tell us, well, the Libertarian Party has failed, nobody is buying their stuff, of course, first of all, ignore all the legal impediments to getting votes in this country, and then secondly, advocate uh, ideas for what we should be suggesting that make us no different from Republicans and Democrats. So what is the point? Is the point that when we get these moderate proposals, we will sneak in even more radical things then when we've done it? In other words, we should be as deceptive as other politicians are and hide our real intent? I don't really think so. And another question came in from James out in cyberspace. And he says, to me, the big news this week is that the Bush administration is working hard as we speak to prevent the sunset provisions of the U.S. Patriot Act from kicking in. In other words, he and his other Nazi cohorts want secret searches, secret detentions, government gag orders, and so on to be the norm in America, and they're prepared to fight for it. On Tuesday, the Washington Post reported that Alberto Gonzalez, the U.S. Attorney General, plans to propose minor modifications to the Patriot Act in a decidedly transparent attempt to forestall and or obfuscate the sunset provisions. Both he and FBI Director Robert Mueller defended the Patriot Act during Senate hearings. On the same day, Senators Craig and Durbin introduced joint legislation aimed at scaling back parts of the law. And James goes on to say, scaling back is not sunsetting, more obfuscation. The writing is again on the wall, and this time it's screaming that the U.S. Patriot Act will not be sunsetting. What can we do? Any suggestions? Well, I believe Downsize D.C. will probably take this on. I haven't been told that, but it's just too much of the kind of issue that they are tend to get involved in. And that will provide the means whereby you can just simply click Enter, pardon me, enter your zip code and click, and you will get an email message ready to go addressed to your congressman. And it is important, I think, that Congress be flooded with a lot of emails from people pointing out that they know that these minor modifications are not going to get rid of the un-American parts of the act. And those people who keep telling us that we are anti-American for supporting the war or that we love Hussein simply because we don't love Bush, uh, these people are the ones who are proposing, proposing the major modifications in America by scrapping the Bill of Rights, scrapping the rules of evidence, scrapping the rule of law, and providing all powerful authority in Washington, D.C. for people to be scurried away uh, with no evidence and held, maybe tortured. As you probably know, the torture now applies not just to Abu Ghraib, but several prisons in Iraq have been discovered to be engaged in torture techniques against Iraqi prisoners. It's going on at Guantanamo Bay. It's going on at prisons in Afghanistan that the U.S. military is running. And here's the important fact. Last week, the U.S. military released 38 detainees, as they call them, prisoners, who were at Guantanamo Bay. They released these 38 and stated that these 38 people had been arrested by mistake. Now, it's not as though they were arrested on Monday evening, held overnight, and then told on Tuesday morning that it was a mistake and let them go with an apology and maybe a gold coin. No, these people were in prison in Guantanamo Bay for three years, and now it is said that they were arrested by a mistake. Were they among the people who were tortured? Well, how would the interrogators know which are the real terrorists and which are those arrested by a mistake? So any time they engage in any kind of torturous activity on a prisoner, they have no way of knowing but what they are doing this to an innocent person. The Red Cross has estimated that 70 to 90 percent of the prisoners held in Iraq were arrested by mistake. They were arrested in sweeps of areas where there were supposed, where it was suspected that there were terrorists in those areas. So they pick up 20, 30, 40, 50 Iraqi young men and figure that some of these have got to be terrorists or insurgents or whatever you want to call them. 
And it's better to be safe than sorry, so we'll get this many rather than a few. And I had a quote, but I don't have it in front of me, but I came across a quote on the Internet of some American general who said, I don't care if we have a 100 innocent Iraqis behind bars, we've got to win this fight. Well, if you sacrifice the freedom and democracy you claim to be bringing to Iraq in order to supposedly bring freedom and democracy to Iraq, you are obviously in such a torturous, logical situation yourself that you shouldn't even be there. All right, back to the Patriot Act. Yes, we do have to fight this thing. It is one of the most un-American things that has ever come along other than in a world war or a giant civil war. We don't consider this to be the kind of war that America was engaged in in the world wars or the civil war, or even the Korean War or the Vietnam War, where it was war and men were being drafted and taken off and Japanese were interned during the Second World War. All kinds of people were interned during the Civil War just for saying publicly that the president was wrong to go to war. Similar things happened in World War I where people were carted off to prison simply because they spoke out against the draft or in some other way exercised their rights of free speech. And we don't seem to have that going on publicly here. We don't think of this as one of those kinds of wars. It's just something that's happening overseas and a handful of Americans have been killed in the process. But the fact of the matter is that we are still getting that awful kind of wartime uh, disregard for the basic freedoms, liberties, and rights that separated America from the rest of the world. I don't know what the answer is on the Patriot Act, but I am for anything that anybody is doing that is hopeful to try to stop the Congress from agreeing to renew the Patriot Act. The sunset provision that was put into the law, and I don't know who it was that got it in there, but congratulations to him for doing the best he could. When the law was passed in late 2001, the law provided that it would die. It would become null and void at the end of 2005 unless it was renewed by Congress. And so we have till the rest of this year, uh, pardon me, they have till the rest of this year to pass a renewal of the act. And we have to fight it on whatever terms they provide. If they say they're going to vote on this in, in May, then we've got to have public opinion amassed against it by May. If they say July, then by July. All right, but it's very interesting that those 38... Um, suspected terrorists were released last week and nobody even bothered to mention that they'd been there for three years that they might have been tortured uh, it's just amazing just as nobody who is a war hawk who says it has been worth it and that it's been worth all sacrifices ever mentions that tens of thousands of Iraqis have died they simply will not recognize that as being relevant Dan in uh, Pennsylvania says I've been buying silvers and gold for several years and I'm convinced these precious metals will explode in price once the comics runs out of silver and the bullion banks abandon the price fixing in the gold market and so forth. At some, months, you, uh, some point months or years down the road, the dollar will crash and precious metals will regain their rightful place as a store of wealth. In your opinion, how long will it take until the dollar breathes its last gasps of life? Uh, all fiat money eventually deflates to zero. And what percentage of my total assets should be held in physical gold and silver, assuming I am risk-averse and fearful of stock and bond markets? I hold about 30% of total assets in precious metals currently. Dan, I'm going to beg off on this question. But I will answer it tomorrow on the Money Show, because that's where it belongs. And I think it's a very good question. You've raised, actually raised several points in there that I would like to discuss on the Money Show. So I'm going to do that tomorrow afternoon. And, in fact, if, if there's time for questions, as I assume that there will be, yours will be the first question that I will take, first email question I will take. And so I hope you will tune in tomorrow. That's 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock Central, 2 o'clock Mountain, and 1 o'clock Pacific on this very network, Genesis Network, or on the Internet, if that's the way you're listening to it. Tom in cyberspace says, I had a couple of discussions lately with people who came here from other countries. One from Peru said that the U.S. should have free education through college. I asked who would pay for this. Very good question, Tom. She didn't have any direct answer, just that the government should do it. I tried to explain the government was not here to provide an education, but she was insistent. I later asked her why she left Peru to come to the U.S. She said she had many more opportunities here and that she could build a better life for herself. I tried to explain that by doing things like providing everyone with a free education, government would grow so large that we would have less freedoms and our opportunities here would be less. She agreed with that but still thought the free education was a good idea. The other discussion was with someone from Germany who had recently retired and was complaining about how low his Social Security benefits were. If he were in Germany, he'd receive a much larger amount. But I said in Germany and many other European countries, they pay far higher Social Security taxes than we do, which is true, Tom. Good point. So the people in those countries have less opportunity to save over the course of their lives. I asked him what he would have done, would he have done better if he paid no Social Security taxes and instead saved the money on his own. He said yes, but he still thought that Social Security was a good idea. These are similar to many discussions I've had over the years, and not just with people from other countries. Even though they may agree with me on a, still, on a, single, on a specific point, they still think that government programs are a good idea. Well, there's a couple of things here to say, Tom. You uh, 
two things, really, that occur to me offhand. Number one, if nothing else, if you continue to have these discussions about various different programs, have the discussions with the same people over time, uh, you simply are piling one thing on top of another, and at some point, an individual is going to say, my God, you know, it's true. These government programs don't work. Why am I supporting them? Why am I promoting them? Now, that may occur in the next discussion you have with somebody. It might not occur for 10 years with another person with whom you have 60 discussions before he finally gets the point that way. It's a case of generalizing on what they already know, and that is going to be different for each individual as to how long it will take for that generalization to sink in. The second thing is that you need to prod people along this road by pointing to where the direction that they should be moving by pointing out yourself that, you know, this didn't work here. You've just pointed out that this doesn't work. Why would you think that the agency that can't do that can over here do something that it can't do there? Uh, we're talking about the same government, the same government that uh, doesn't give you two, three, or four mail deliveries a day like any free market postal company would and all free market postal companies used to do before the postal monopoly started. Uh, we're talking about the same one that is giving such lousy education to our children that keeps dragging us into wars that can't keep the streets safe. Why are you asking and expecting this outfit to do good in this area that you're concerned about now? Well, that joyful music by Johann Sebastian Bach uh, reminds us that we are here as individuals not to save the world but to find the best life we can for ourselves, to find the happiness that you seek and that you hope for your children and your relatives and your friends, uh, that is the first order of business. And I believe, as I said earlier in the show, that libertarian principles guide us to that better life just as much as they do uh, in trying to organize society. And one of the uh, objections I was going to get to in the show, uh, but got then got sidetracked by the number of emails, that have questions, and I'm glad to have those emails because that means I'm talking about things that you're concerned about, not just things that I think are interesting. But one of the ones that I had here, in case it was time, was written by a writer who's somewhat famous who said, Purist libertarianism works beautifully in theory, but not in an upside-down world drowning in a sea of uncivilized behavior. Well, I happen to know that this particular writer read my book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, and was so impressed with it that he got in touch with me. And one of the points that I made very strongly in that book was that if you were in a society of liars, you would still be far better off to be as honest as you can. That the answer to the problem of being among liars would not be to lie yourself. If you were in a society of stealers, the answer would not be to steal, but to be, again, an honest man who, doesn't, who respects the property of other people. That this would set you apart and make you better. In other words, the point is that these principles work no matter what the situation is. If you're in a society of honest people, you are still better to be honest. Because if all these other people are honest and you're not, then there are far better choices, multiple choices available to people rather than using your services and having to worry about your dishonesty. So whatever the society, whatever the situation, these principles work. And it is important to realize that when the government gets us in a bad situation, as I said two or three times tonight, the answer is not more government to get us out, but to get rid of the government program completely and quickly, not slowly, over a long period of time and gradually. That's not the answer. Libertarian ideas work, and that's why we promote them. And I especially hope you'll be back next week. This is Harry Brown. Do something good for yourself and your family this week. Thanks for listening.